We'll just roll over to one o'clock, and I like to be punctual. So uh, I think we'll get started. Uh, welcome to Drupal DevOps on Azure websites. Uh, my name is Corey Fowler. I'm a technical evangelist from Microsoft Corporation. I came all the way from Seattle to come here today to talk. So hopefully you enjoy it. Uh, I think we're going to have a lot of interesting uh, little piece of discussion to talk about. Um, before I get going, how many people have actually used Windows Azure before or at least know what it is? Oh, brilliant. More than half the room. That's awesome. So I shouldn't have to clear through this all that much. Uh, what is Azure? Um, Azure is a set of uh, highly scalable data centers all around the world. We have 16 data centers worldwide uh, spanning the US, Europe, Asia, um, as well as Australia today, um, which is really, really awesome. We have a variety of services. I just gave out a number of posters that kind of clears out what we have available to uh, you for Windows Azure. Uh, I'm going to focus specifically on two parts today. One are Windows Azure websites, um, sorry, Microsoft Azure websites offering, which is a great high density hosting platform. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about our VM platform um, because there's a one key DevOps component that I want to show off uh, there as well. We've had some pretty awesome momentum over the last year, um, bringing new features on at a rapid pace. It's been very exciting to be working in this space because it seems like every three weeks we have something new um, and fun to play with. So I've been keeping really busy going through and, and playing with the new features that have been coming out um, and look forward to new things that continue to come out. Um, we have great support for a lot of open source on Azure. Um, not only just language support, but we actually have um, in the galleries for uh, both websites and virtual machines, uh, open source CMSs. So we have Drupal in a gallery, so you get an easy click through wizard installation process. Um, we manage a huge uh, Hadoop service called HD Insight, which is um, <clears throat> pretty interesting because it, it avoids having to go and set up a high scale cluster of Hadoop yourself. You just click and spin it up and turn it off whenever you need to. Uh, lots of different support. We just added a Redis uh, cache provider to our uh, platform so you can get a full scale Redis server up and running to do caching of your front end services. Um, as well as uh, four different distributions of Linux within our virtual machine offering. Uh, and we have great support for uh, a lot of new DevOps tools that are coming out today. So Chef, Puppet, uh, Vagrant, Docker, um, just a lot of great things coming out, um, and and we're we're supporting them as quickly as we can. So to clear through, what is Azure Websites? Uh, Azure Websites, like I said, is a high density hosting platform. What does that mean to you? Uh, very simplistic uh, way to start deploying things into the cloud. In fact, it's probably the fastest way to build for the cloud today. So um, you, all you need to do is go and spin up a server. It's up in a matter of seconds. Uh, you can connect your code into it using source control management, uh, and it just goes out and deploys. You don't have to worry about maintaining PHP, uh, the operating system packages, anything pat patches, anything along those lines. Uh, we do all that for you as part of uh, our platform as a service offering. And it's open and flexible for everyone. So, like I said before, we support a variety of different languages. Um, you can host all of them in a single website, which is interesting. I have a really cool demo that I do at other conferences where I actually have every single language, uh, just a small application, and show off all the support running in a single site. But we're here to talk DevOps today. So let's talk about Git deployment. <clears throat> this is an interesting way uh, to just go in and uh, deploy your applications out. So I'm just going to go into our portal here. We have two portals currently. Um, this is the full featured portal, we'll call it. Uh, there's also a preview portal that I'll show you a little bit later on if we have some time. Um, but the, the easiest way to get going really is just to go and hit new uh, and custom create a website. And you can see here, all you need to do is enter a URL. So I'm just going to say DrupalCon AMS. Uh, you can go and deploy that in different hosting plans, which are kind of defined by regions. So I'm going to stick with the West Europe region because that's right here in Amsterdam. Uh, we can create a new database. Uh, we have offerings for both a SQL uh, database, which is Microsoft SQL, and uh, MySQL databases. So you can go in, set something up. For right now, I'm not going to worry about that. 
and I'm going to publish from source control. So I have the ability to go out and uh, choose from a variety of different sources for this. Um, I can use the Microsoft Virtual uh, Visual Studio Online. I can use a local Git repository. But I think the more interesting ones are uh, the support for GitHub, Bitbucket, um, or just any kind of external repository, which could be either a Git repository or Mercurial. So I'm just going to choose GitHub, and uh, we'll go over here. That was going off to GitHub to do OAuth, but I'm already signed in, so I don't have to worry about that. And basically what it does is it pulls in a, a huge listing of all the repositories I have access to, which for me, as an evangelist, I have quite a few. So I'm just going to um, type in, oops, no. There we go. Do that again. So I'm just going to type in Drupal, uh, which I did. I uh, just forked the Drupal web or the Drupal project straight from GitHub. And uh, in order to get the right branch, I just do 7x. Um, and what that will do is create a new site. Once the site's created, it goes off to GitHub and says, hey, I need some source from you. And uh, adding that 7x says it will bring Drupal 7 over to Azure websites. So I already have uh, a Drupal site set up here. So I'm just going to flip over. Um, and basically what this has done, if you look at the deployment tab, you can see the history of the deployments coming from uh, GitHub. And one of the interesting things about this is not only have we gone out and done uh, deployment through GitHub, but we have the ability to kind of trigger uh, new um, functionality during the deployment process. So I can see here that they've generated a deployment script and it's running deployment commands, which in this case is really just copying a bunch of files. Um, but we're going to talk about hooking into that in a, in a little bit. So this is my Drupal site that I have up and running. Um, this was just pulling straight from the repository. I did have to go in and configure it, obviously. Um, but this means anytime I pull or I push something out to my local or to my clone of the Drupal repository, um, the new source code is going to come back directly into my site, which is really, really nice. So continuous deployment. Uh, like I said before, choose your own adventure. Tons of different options for you to go and hook into uh, Azure websites. Um, this is how we can go out and, and manage our deployment process, the whole pipeline. And I'm going to just move over to that in a second. But basically, we have a set of uh, cross-platform tools, which allows you to go and um, interact with Azure directly from the command line. And some of the reasons you might want to go and, and modify this deployment script is something along the lines of other uh, installing dependencies with uh, potentially Composer, um, compiling source code I have there, just in case you might have to do some uh, compiling of JavaScript, like type, or, um, CoffeeScript libraries or TypeScript. Uh, you might minify JavaScript or expand SAS or less. Um, but you could also do continuous integration tasks, like running your unit tests before the deployment. So if any of those tests fail, it doesn't deploy the new code base out to your site. Everything's good to go. So I've, uh, I've built out a deployment time dependency management thing with um, Composer, but I just wanted to show you the command line tools that we have here. Um, they actually took away my favorite feature recently. We used to have some amazing ASCII art at the top, so I'm kind of disappointed by that, and I think I'm going to go log an issue on GitHub later on today. Um, but you can see here, I can just type in Azure Site, and I get a listing of commands that I can do for the website. So there's actually quite a few things here. Um, I can start stop my website, I can create new sites, I can go and add uh, app settings which are unique values that go into my site. So if I wanted to keep things on a site specific level, I can add those app settings and they're exposed to me during uh, using environment variables. You can set up domains, certificates, um, certificates being SSL certificates obviously. And uh, there's another feature called web jobs that I'll get into a little bit later. So going and using those tools, if I just type in Azure Site Deployment Script, and I'm just going to use the help file here, 
Um, basically what this does is it generates a dot deployment file and that hooks our deployment engine um, to say, hey, I have a custom version of this deployment that you need to run. Uh, and it also creates a script for you. So this could either be in a, a command, <clears throat> sort of like Windows command line or a bash script. Uh, and you'll see here the deployment scripts, there's a, a couple different varieties just because uh, we support a number of different languages. But you'll probably want to use the dash dash PHP uh, and that will get PHP specific deployment script for you. Um, and then your output type is dash T here, which is how you can switch between batch and bash. So I've already created that and uh, I have it up and running here on another page. So um, in my GitHub repository, I have this project called uh, WAWS dash composer. And basically this is the deploy CMD file that it generates for you. Uh, it just goes and sets up a whole bunch of paths and everything, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, this highlighted part I'll get to in a second. Uh, then it basically goes off and uses website deployment. So we use this uh, command line uh, synchronization tool called Kudu Sync. And basically what that does is it keeps an eye on the different files in your site. Uh, so when we do a new deployment, we don't end up crushing any user-generated data. Uh, that might have been saved off to your website. So this highlighted area up here, um, this is the section that I added to go and download uh, Composer. So uh, basically what I've done is just used the curl command, I go to get Composer installer, it runs that, comes back, uh, and then basically just set up um, the PHP script here. And then you see at the bottom, I do dependency installs, uh, so basically just run uh, PHP, use that environment variable for where the code's been deployed to, uh, run composer, and then just run the install file so it goes out and gets all my, my vendor files for me. Extending the environment. So um, there's a couple of different things that you can do here. Once we have our site up and running, um, it's great. We have a production website, uh, but we're talking about DevOps. That means we want to do a lot of this continuous integration, continuous deployment kind of thing. Uh, and we just set up, uh, just Git deployment in a single area. So that means, yes, I'm doing Git deployment from GitHub to my production site. But say I want to have a staging environment, something along those lines. Well, that's something that can be, be achievable by this feature called site slots that we have. And basically what this is, is uh, it takes your main website and associates other web spaces to it. And these are individual web spaces, so they run in their own, uh, they run in their own container. So this isn't like everything's running in the same website, but sort of separated. This is a full brand new web space for you to deploy to, um, but it gives you a few options. And what that is, is um, once you go and create that secondary site, you can then uh, either clone the configuration from your previous site or go through the whole process of hooking up the source control management. Uh, this provides a nice staging environment where you can uh, continuously pull stuff into, go test, uh, and then later on uh, we'll show you how you can actually swap between these sites uh, or use this new feature called testing and production to kind of move traffic around to them. The second thing that you can do is uh, this thing's called site extensions. And site extensions are really interesting uh, because they, they allow you to go and add additional functionality to Azure websites um, within the same context of your site. So you can use this for administering your site. Um, like you can see here, we have the PHP My Admin tool at, alongside here. So you can actually use that in, say, your staging site to look at your database connections and figure out what's going on in your data and not requiring additional tools. So say you're out on the road, all you have is your um, iPad or some sort of tablet with you. You can log into your website and still be effective um, by using some of these tools. So what I'd like to show you now is um, how I've leveraged Azure websites uh, to go and install Drush to be able to do management of my Drupal site uh, with Drush.
So uh, we left off here before where I have my Drupal website that I set up and I have Git integration. And uh, you can see the website up here is uh, drupalcon-drush.azurewebsites.net. And um, this, this is the public URL. Um, you can go and add a domain name to that to have a nice um, pleasing URL that kind of conforms to your company. Um, but every site has uh, a different subsite. So if I was to go here and add dash dot, or sorry, dot SCM, um, I get into this site here. And what this is, is it's a backend system that allows you to hook up the site extensions. Uh, it provides command line access to your website, um, which we can do also from the local machine. I'll show you that in a second. Um, but it provides a, a great little interface for you to kind of go in and see what's happening with your website at this particular time. <clears throat> so what I've done is uh, I've downloaded Drush uh, in my site directory. And I've also downloaded Composer. Um, and that allows me to go and do dependency management for Drush. Uh, and then <clears throat> once I have Drush installed, what I've done is run these two commands, and I'm using PowerShell right here, and I understand that you can't see that. Um, but the commands are setting aliases for Drush, so I can go off to my web root uh, and use Drush instead of having to have it sitting in my WW root and have other people have access to it, which I don't want. I've moved this away, set an alias for it, and I can still go uh, and do my commands. And then I've also set an alias for Composer, um, just so I can use the just composer command instead of having to do a full path or anything along those lines. So I'll just cancel out of here. I'm just going to, I'm in my site route, so I have the ability now to just say drush. Uh, I'm just going to clear the cache. It's something simple to do here, uh, and I'm just going to clear all. And uh, Interesting. Might just have to refresh that. Um, so we'll go into my site here. Just going to have to cancel. rerun these two commands. WW root. There we go. And we'll just say drush, clear cache all. And it's going to go through and clear the cache. Now, you can go through and do whatever you need to do from within there. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, uh, we have site extensions. So I'm working with the team to figure out what we can do uh, to make Drush a site extension. So it's a lot easier. You can just go off and add in um, the Drush site extension. We'll inject it into the site for you, set up the aliases, and you'll be able to go out and use it. And you can see here that. Uh, our, our clear cache command was successful. So I did this in the web interface. How do we go and use this from our command line? Um, we have this other tool called Kudu Exec. Uh, Kudu is the, Kudu's the backend deployment engine that we use for Azure websites. Um, so basically what you do is you say Kudu Exec and then you pass in that source control or site control management URL, uh, which is what I talked about to get to the management uh, layer that we were just looking at. Then we enter our username and password, and now I actually have full command line access to my site directly from my machine. So you can see here I'm browsing through. Uh, I can go up to my WW root. There's my full Drupal installation. If I go back a directory, you'll be able to see you know, my Drush file that I had in there, uh, the init script that I used to set the aliases and all those things. So this is a pretty interesting way to be able to leverage the command line uh, against your website and gives you a lot of power to go in and do what you need to do uh, to get your site up and running the way you need it. Corey, can I just ask you a quick question about that? Yeah, quick question. Um, I see you typing ls rather than dir, but the prompt looks like a, a Windows prompt rather yep. than a back prompt. What, what environment is running on the, the back end of that line? So um, that command line in particular is running uh, the Windows command line, but they've aliased a lot of those commands for you. Because um, I, I kind of venture back and forth between 
you know, Linux world and Mac world and, and PC. So I actually use PowerShell most of the time. And that's why I use the PowerShell console on the website. Um, but yeah, a lot of the commands there are aliased for you just so um, if you are coming from a Mac or Linux environment, you can use the commands that you used to. Cool. Uh, cron jobs. So everyone's used to Drupal cron, yes? Uh, how many people have issues with Drupal cron? Anyone? So the, I think I've, the biggest complaint that I've heard is the fact that the cron jobs are running in the same context of your website. And that's a big issue, right? If you have a site, it's very popular. You don't want a cron job sitting there running, taking up CPU power as you're trying to serve up traffic. So <clears throat> this is something that's interesting. We can actually go in. I'm just going to explain what web jobs are. Uh, web jobs are our answer to cron on Windows Azure. And basically what it allows you to do is it's a simple interface. You provide us with a script file of any kind. It can be PHP. It can be JavaScript. It could be PowerShell, it could be Bash, anything. What we do is we run that alongside your site. Now what you're going to say is, hey, Corey, you just said we don't want these things running alongside our site. Why are you telling us it's going to run alongside the site? Well, you have the ability to continue to do that. But if you want to separate them out, you can, right? So we're going to go and create a web job. Very simple thing to do. <laughs> I'll just go into my site here. I already have a site set up. You'll notice it has Drupal cron. Um, so these sites are uh, all kind of independent pieces. But there's nothing to say that they can't communicate to each other. So if I wanted to write um, crons for, say, my, my Drupal cron Drush site, there's nothing wrong with that. I can do that. If I expose an API or something along those lines, if I need to actually interact with the site, that's perfectly fine. Um, we do actually expose an API for this. Um, so if you have anything going on in the back end of your site, um, like triggering web jobs or you have webhooks or you like to pull from source control, all of our REST APIs are sitting in the back end here and it allows you to go out and do whatever you need to. So to interact with those from a different site, go into the site you want to interact with, look at the REST API, go off to the Kudu wiki, and they'll describe how you can actually go and interact with that. I'm just, uh, in these two examples, I'm doing something locally on the machine, but there's nothing saying that I couldn't do otherwise. And I'm just going to take advantage of the Monaco editor that we have sitting with inside Windows Azure websites. So once again, if you're away, you're playing around on your iPad, you need a development environment to do something quickly, easy thing you can do, boot up this online editor. And uh, you can see here I have a little bit of a convention going on. and Basically, these jobs are built in this convention so you can check them into source control, right? So we have an app data folder. The app data folder has a jobs folder. The jobs folder has two different types of jobs that it can run. One's continuous, one's triggered. Continuous meaning it's going to run all the time, and if it fails, we're going to try and boot it back up for you as quickly as possible. Triggered means it can either be triggered by a schedule uh, or triggered using the API or going to the... Um, the Azure uh, management site and clicking the run button. Uh, but what I've done here is I've created two uh, web jobs. One's called delete logs, and this is a bash script. So you can see here I'm just going through and removing a, uh, the log file. So d colon home log files php errors. So this is my local um, file system. If I wanted to go off to the other file system, you can see here. We have an API for files, um, and it's actually running the API. So uh, it's the, the site that you want to uh, leverage, dash API, and then we have VSF, which is virtual file system. So you could actually go through and ping and do a delete against that um, from one environment to another. And the other one is just a PHP file, just to show that you can do it. Um, but I'm going off and I'm getting the environment uh, the region that it's actually deployed to. So this is just going off using a simple PHP script and doing something. So now I'm back in the Azure portal, uh, and both these are triggered jobs. So I'm just going to go here and run this report region. I can do that straight from the, the management portal. 
And then I have the ability to go off to the logs here to see how well that uh, task went and ran. And hopefully I still have internet connectivity. There we go. Awesome. So it just ran 19 seconds ago. Uh, so we can see what command did it run. Um, just in case you have multiple files in there. What it's going to do is it's going to look for run dot whatever the extension is first. From there, if there isn't a run dot, it's going to do it in alphabetical order. Um, and it's only going to run one file at a time. So you can go in here. Here's our run details. It was successful. Here's the uh, console output that it had. And you can see here we're running in West Europe, which is our local data center to right here. So that was pretty easy. <clears throat> so I wanted to talk about virtual machines. Um, just really quickly. So Azure Virtual Machines, uh, you can spin up from one VM to hundreds of VMs. Uh, we have tons of different images available, um, both Windows and Linux machines, uh, depending on what you have a preference for. Um, all of them are here. I'm kidding. We have tons of them. We have a lot more than this, but we have four different distributions of Linux. Uh, we have a whole bunch of different Oracle virtual machine images. Uh, we have a Puppet Labs image, so if you need a Puppet agent, that's all ready to go for you. Uh, and then we have a couple of Microsoft-specific ones. Um, there's also this thing called VM Depot, where we have a lot of great images from Bitnami and other partners, uh, where they've gone and set up a Drupal environment for you. So you can go and leverage those as well. Virtual Machine Extensions. Um, this is how we take advantage of uh, other uh, useful tools. Um, so basically the extensions get placed in uh, with the virtual machine as they start up. So this is how we support things like Chef, Puppet, um, antivirus through Semantic Antivirus and Docker, uh, as well as other things like PowerShell, remote management and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> but this allows us to use Vagrant. So I'm gonna do a quick demo here on how to use Vagrant against Windows Azure. Uh, it's very quite easy. I went and ran it earlier just to make sure the machine was up and running for me. Um, but <clears throat> how many people know about Vagrant? Good, a great portion of you. Uh, shouldn't have let that slide to the bottom. There we go. So all I did here was set Vagrant up. I have to part, uh, pass in dash dash provider Azure. Um, but that says, great, let's go leverage Windows Azure uh, to do this. So it goes through. This red line is not an error. It's just saying, hey, we don't have an existing thing, so we have to go and create everything. Uh, and then it goes and creates all the deployment stuff off, as you would usually see. Um, I'm just going to clear this out. I ran a provisioning script as well. Um, to get this, all you need to do is say Vagrant plugin install Vagrant Azure. Dash Azure. So that, that's uh, really awesome and ready to go. And I have one more thing here to show you is the actual Vagrant file. So uh, Vagrant config configuration, uh, we have a dummy box that you can call whatever you want. Uh, the box really takes care of the size of the VM, so you can create a number of different boxes just to delineate the size. Uh, then there's three main things you need for Azure. You need the management uh, certificate, that's how we interact with the Azure API and know it's that it's on behalf of you, uh, and then your subscription ID. The image, <clears throat> we use the, the Azure command line tools. So we can say Azure account cert export, and that's how we got the, the management certificate. And then to get the image, we can say Azure account image list. That's gonna go out and get the huge list of VM images we have. Um, so you can see it's actually a pretty extensive list. Just grab the full string, so you know, the starting number to the end, uh, and then, then you're ready to go. Once you set that up, you can just say Vagrant SSH, and that will go off and connect to our box for us, just like we're expecting uh, Vagrant to do. And there we go, we're in our machine. So I ran a provisioning script with this, so if I say which PHP, it should be able to say PHP is installed. We can see, yep, it's off in that directory. Um, so this is all set up and ready to go for our Azure PHP SDK. 
uh, as a development environment. <clears throat> so that's really great. We can go back here and say Vagrant Destroy, and it will go and tear down all the environment stuff for us. So just wrapping up, go off, uh, use Vagrant plugin install Vagrant Azure, grab the tooling, and uh, thank you very much for joining me today. I'm assuming we just switch over. Do you uh, want to let us know? Okay, hi. My name is uh, Tim Kreitzer. I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, Drupal and Ruby and why we should be friends. Um, I'm Tim. I'm from Portland, Oregon, not too far from where Corey's from in Seattle. Uh, we like to keep it weird in Portland. I work for New Relic, a monitoring company. I run the Ruby agent development. Now, if you're wondering why New Relic sent someone who works on Ruby to DrupalCon, the reason is before coming to New Relic, I also was a manager for Drupal teams and built sites for Nike, Intel, Hitachi, uh, mostly marketing sites, some things from small sites, a couple pages to enterprise learning systems. So just a quick little bit about New Relic and what we do. Um, application performance monitoring, you install our agent and we give you detailed statistics and analysis of what your application is doing, help you find performance problems, help you get alerted if there's outages, that sort of thing. Uh, specifically, if you are a Drupal person, we have uh, Drupal instrumentation. We automatically detect if it's a Drupal site, can tell you if your new custom module that you just installed is making your site three times as slow, that sort of thing. If that's interesting to you, we're downstairs in the exhibit hall way at the end, and I have a bunch of little cards that will give you a 30-day free trial instead of just 14 days. So come on by and grab one. So I wanted to give this talk because I really care passionately about developer tools. And I feel like, especially in the Drupal community, after having been in it for about five years, it's very common for Drupal people to see every Drupal, Drupal as the solution to every problem. And I want to have more tools in the toolbox all the time. The professional athletes, when they're training, they don't play their sport 12 months out of the year. They take summers, they do other things, they play golf, they have, they have fun, they have a good time, they, they do other physical activities, they do cross training. And I think as developers, it's good for us too. Obviously, we want to become more proficient at the things that, we are, that we're the specialists in, but we also, a wider base of knowledge is a good thing. So that's why I'm giving this talk. In Ruby, I want to show a, couple, a little bit of the fundamentals of the language just so you get an idea of what it looks like. Um, everything's an object in Ruby, so you can ask a string to make itself into uppercase. You can run an iterator through an array and ask and get a capitalized version of all of them, or you can even take a range object and convert it into an array. Every object, every, everything, even numbers can receive methods, strings can receive methods. 
Here's a quick example of a Ruby class. This is from one of my own applications, a music database. I'm including some modules. You can do inheritance in Ruby, but you can't do multiple inheritance, so it's much more common to use composition and include multiple modules instead of trying to do inheritance. I've got some custom things for doing um, database fields. So has many is a MongoDB adapter method that creates a relationship to another class. This is an example of Ruby domain specific languages. So those are actually just methods. Has many field and validates are all just regular methods that can be called without um, parentheses. And then I've also defined a bunch of custom methods myself. One of the real powers of the Ruby language is gems. And uh, you can create a gem file that looks just like this. You specify all of the gems that you want. You can say version information, maybe I want anything newer than 3.1 or anything that's in the same family as 2.2 or something like that. And then it will automatically resolve and install all of your dependencies for you. If you've used Composer, NPM, they're, they're both inspired by how Bundler and Gem work. So I wanted to talk a little bit also about Ruby frameworks. Obviously everyone knows Rails and you can find lots of stuff about Rails, but there's a couple smaller ones that are a lot easier to learn if you want to try just a little bit of Ruby without learning a ton of stuff at once. A lot of Ruby frameworks use Rack, which is a Ruby object-based approach to building a layered web server. You put Rack little Rack classes on top of each other and you have a full application. Anytime you have an object that can respond to a call method within a response code, headers, and content, you're done. You have an application. In New Relic, you can see this is an example of a Rails application and all the Rack middle layers being instrumented all the way down. Another really common framework that's a really great starting point if you want to play with Ruby is called Sinatra. It's a micro framework. All it does is just routing, templates, before and after filters, sessions, and caching. It doesn't do database stuff. It doesn't do email processing. It's much lighter. So if you want to just make a quick little site or a quick little application, Sinatra is really great to play with. This four lines of code is a complete and total Sinatra application. It will work just fine. You can deploy it to Heroku. You can deploy it to anywhere you would normally deploy Ruby. So if you already are using, you may, you may already be re using Ruby and not really know about it. Some of the things that Drupal people use, Compass, this is, a, this is a Ruby application for front end people to be able to do SaaS. It's basically a SaaS toolkit. It gives you a mixing gallery, plugins, uh, Compass Clean and Compass Compile. This is really great if you have a complex SaaS based theme. It will automatically do all your pre-processing for you or you can even run Compass Watch and it will just do it for you on the fly. So if you're not using this and you are using SaaS in your themes, you really should check it out. Also, Chef and Puppet are really famous um, applications for doing server provisioning, and they're both written in Ruby as well. They're actually Ruby. The, the code you write for a Chef cookbook or a Puppet uh, file are both just regular Ruby. So this is a Chef cookbook to install Nginx. Really simple Ruby. And then Corey was mentioning in his session Vagrant as well. Vagrant is also written in Ruby, so if you want to be able to work closely with um, Vagrant and edit your Vagrant file and do complicated things in it, a little bit of Ruby will help you. Specifically for Drupal, I want to talk a little bit too. Everyone here at this conference is talking about Drupal in SOA, services oriented architecture, doing headless Drupal, exposing Drupal data to external applications, new view layers. Um, I am a big fan of the feeds module for Drupal for getting data in and out. It's really simple and really easy to use, but there's a lot of different ways to do it. And Ruby is a great partner to Drupal in this way. I want to show you guys um, a little example of something that I built. This is for a athletics competition called the Wild Canyon Games that's held in Eastern Oregon. It's a big event. A bunch of people come together and just compete for a long weekend. This is all the bicycles lined up for people ready to go. We wanted to do something specifically at the Wild Canyon Games for a group of about 200 executives. Each one of them was given a Nike Plus fuel band that tracked their activity, and we had them train in teams in the weeks leading up to the event. And basically we wanted to do leaderboards to say which team has the most fuel points for each week, each month, individual leaderboards, that sort of thing. It would be really easy, and we already had an existing uh, Drupal 7 site at wildcanyongames.org. It would not be too hard to talk to the Nike Fuel Plus API and get data, and they have, they have a pretty good published API. The documentations are, are pretty good. But, as it happens, there's already a Ruby gem that does all of the talking to Nike Plus for you. It has all of the endpoints mapped across. It knows how to do the OAuth authentication. It's really easy to use. 
So we set up a little architecture that looks like this. The Drupal site is at the very end, Drupal PHP. And in the middle, I wrote a little Rails application using Ruby hosted at Heroku, which you can do very quickly and easily, to take data out of that gem and transform it, aggregate it, and basically prepare it to come into Drupal. So the Nike Plus data looks like this in Ruby code. So you can see all the activity stuff and coming, that's coming back from Nike. A lot of this stuff we didn't really care about, so that was fine. I was able to go through and do summing and totaling and kind of aggregate it all together and get it into a feed that looks like this. So this is a feed that's JSON. It's ready to be imported directly into the Drupal application. We were able to set up a Drupal cron task that runs and just hits this feed every hour and grabs new things and makes Drupal nodes. And then on the Drupal side, we built the leaderboard and uh, actually displayed the data. Questions about that kind of approach? Does anybody have anything? I must have talked really fast because that was like 11 minutes. And that's what I have. <laughs> so hopefully if, I, if you guys have more detailed questions or want to um, look at some other things we can, we have, we have some time. Or if you have questions for Corey, that's okay too. That's how we do our PHP instrumentation. Yes, we also monitor Ruby.net. You know. So I guess the, the question, one of the questions that Lorna Jane said that we should ask all our prospective hosts is can we install extensions? Oh. Does, uh, does Azure accept um, various PHP extensions? Yeah, there's a letter mic there if you want, actually. Uh, so, does Azure accept various PHP extensions? Um, yes. Basically, there's a couple of different ways that you can go and uh, provide the extension, uh, right? Because we, we manage PHP for you. Uh, so, in that case, um, we have a set of default extensions that are enabled. Any other extension that you want to enable, you need to uh, bin deploy. So, in your WW root folder, you create a bin folder. Um, that protects it from remote acts, like uh, remote execution and anything along those lines. Um, and then the app settings that I talked about, uh, there's a reserved word called PHP unders underscore extensions. Um, and you make that the key of the app setting. And then uh, if you do a comma delimited list of relative paths, so you do bin slash and then the extension name, um, that will go and enable them within the, uh, the built-in PHP version. Um, if you need to manage your own PHP version or would like to have full control over the PHP INI file, uh, there's this thing that you can do, which is like bring your own runtime, uh, and you, you go and you configure the actual HTTP handler in the platform to point to a bin deployed version of PHP. Uh, then you can just use the EXT folder of that version of PHP and the uh, PHP I and I file from that in order to enable them. I know we're also doing a lot of work on our .NET agent team around Azure and making the Azure experience to be as quickly, as easy as possible, but I don't know if that's specifically for PHP. I think that's more around. I think the, the PHP plugin right now for New Relic is mostly for Linux. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, we're working Azure, on it. Uh, yeah, Azure Websites runs Windows and IS, yeah. so uh, the new Relic plugin right now, I don't think, actually works with an Azure website. Probably not. Yeah. Other questions? Was this interesting? I mean, was that in is some, hopefully, it was quick, I know, but it was a quick tour of some other stuff that you might not play with every day, and my, I hope that you'll check it out. Okay, thanks.